I'm going to start us off with some recap of last week trivia. This is trivia from last week in a recap, okay? So here's how this works. If you think you know the answer to the question that I'm about to give, I need you to stand up and raise your hand. Both stand up and raise your hand. Don't just shout it out. That doesn't count. Don't just raise your hand. That doesn't count. Stand up and raise your hand. And if you get it right, we will give you a VTI t-shirt, much like the one that I am sporting right now. Okay. Wall supplies last. Question number one for a VTI t-shirt. Question number one. What theory do we hold to for biblical authorship? You got to stand up and raise your hand. First one I saw. Yes, verbal plenary. Very good, very good, very good. Absolutely. Um, Sam, did you catch that one over there? I don't, I don't know where Sam went. We'll get you a shirt. Um, question number two. Again, make sure you stand up and raise your hand in order to answer this question. Question number two, what is the name of an original copy of an ancient document? What is the name? Oh, right here. First one I saw. Go ahead. Autograph. Very good. All right. T-shirt over there. And the third and final question in our VTI trivia for a T-shirt. Again, stand up and raise your hand. Name three books that can be found in the Apocrypha. Oh, no. Three, two, one. Next. Well done. Well done. I would have even given you First and Second Maccabees as different books. So, well done. Awesome. That was First and Second Maccabees, Tobit, and Judith. Awesome. Well done. Um, awesome. Guys, we're gonna, I'm going to hand off the mic here to Jameis in just a minute. Um, and we are so glad that you guys are here. Again, uh, we welcome all of our community groups and discipleship groups. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Um, also, if you're a community group leader or discipleship group leader and you want to come with your group, please let us know. Um, I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then I'll have Jameis come up and we'll get started. Lord God, we love you. Lord, thankful for an opportunity to open your word and apply it to our lives. Lord God, you are good. Uh, Lord, you are full of wisdom and mercy. Lord, we're thankful uh, that your scriptures are living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, we're thankful that we can apply these scriptures uh, to our lives, Lord, in a very real way. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds, Lord, um, as we just learn about how to interpret your word. Lord God, we love you, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Snuck up on well, hey, y'all. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, week two of VTI. So I would just be uh, not a good person if we didn't start tonight by singing happy birthday to a very special person. Um, a very special woman who is one of the founding members of our church, uh, who without her and those like her, we would not have a church. And you're not supposed to say the age of, of people, um, but I'm going to because she's like a mother to me, and she is 75, and it's Phyllis Taylor. So, Phil, stand on up. There she is, Miss Phyllis, one of our originals. She sang on the original praise and worship team here. Her husband, who is in heaven now, also sang here for years, and so I can't sing, so I'm going to turn off my mic and ask all of you all together to sing happy birthday to Miss Phyllis on three. One, two, three. Well, tonight is week two. Uh, we're glad and honored that you're here. Um, for those of you that are back for week two, I'm glad you're back. I don't know if anybody would come back because I went so long last week. But uh, for those of you that are here for the first time, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, if you missed, obviously you missed last week. If you weren't here, you can find it online. So go to our Pleasant Valley YouTube page. And you will find everything we discussed last week there. Just Google PVCC YouTube, and it should be the first video that pops up. 
And I would encourage you to watch it because a lot of the talks do kind of build on each other every week. All right. So uh, we, we did run out of time last week and didn't get to do questions. So I'm planning on speaking a shorter amount of time tonight, which you'll be happy to hear so that we can have questions at the end. So just jot down questions as we go, all right? So I prefer to be down here on the floor so it doesn't feel so Sunday-ish, you know, like I like more of a classroom feel, but we're grateful that, that the number of people that are here, the line of sight wasn't good, and so that's why I'm up here, uh, just, just so you'll know we uh, are grateful. It's a good problem to have. All right, so here's the question we're going to start with tonight in your notes. If you weren't here last week, you do need notes. If you didn't get those on the way in, you can go to the front or back and grab them. Fill in the blank. I will say all the fill in the blanks, and you will see them right up here on your screens. All right? Well, uh, why is biblical interpretation important? In other words, why is it important to learn how to interpret the Bible? Maybe you've heard the story about the man who desperately uh, wanted to have God speak directly to him, just praying for God to, to give him a word. So he, he prayed really, really hard, and he just... He trusted the Holy Spirit. He's like, whenever I open the Bible, whatever I put my finger on, that's going to be the word uh, that God has for me. Okay, so he opened up the Bible, put his finger down, and the verse said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. He's like, all right, that can't be right. That can't be God, what God is saying to me. So he blindly turned to another page, put his finger down, and the Bible said, go thou and do likewise. He's like, oh, no, he's getting scared. This can't be God's will. So he does it again. And the third verse says, what thou doest, do quickly. So uh, clearly that is not how we study the Bible. Have, but have we ever done that? Just kind of like open up the Bible, randomly put our finger down, and, like, and just almost assume it's going to be some kind of prophetic word for us. Probably not the most helpful approach, is it? Uh, let me give you another example uh, that, that's actually true. Uh, 21 years ago, I was a college student at Murray State University. It was the spring of 2003, and I wrote down the following words in my journal, quoting, This is confirmation, Lord. She is the one you have chosen for me. I'm going to marry her, exclamation point. Thank you so much, Lord, for speaking to me so clearly through your word, period. I journaled those words as a 19-year-old, uh, been dating this girl for, I don't know, six, eight months. And on that particular night, I was really praying for God's wisdom on whether or not uh, she was the one, right, that we were supposed to get married. And uh, so I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And then I opened up my Bible and almost kind of thought, all right, God, you're about to confirm, yay or nay, should I marry her? And so I actually picked it up to Genesis chapter 24. I've been reading through Genesis in my devotion. And I picked it up that night with the story of Isaac and Rebekah coming together in marriage. Just so happened. That was the passage. And, and there I read these words in the Bible. The thing has come from the Lord. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son. God, you spoke. There it is. I literally just prayed, am I supposed to marry this girl? I open up my Bible. It basically says, marry her. Now I know who my life's going to be. Three months later, we break up. <laughs> Two years later, I'm married way, way up, and the Lord brought Annie and I together, who was not the person about which the journal entry was written, in case you're wondering. Uh, so what happened that night? Did God's word mislead me? Was God's word mistaken? No. I was mistaken in my interpretation and approach to Scripture. There's a right way and a wrong way to read and understand the Bible. Okay? So the reason biblical interpretation is important, this is your first fill in the blank, is there is both a correct and incorrect way to understand the Bible. Scripture itself teaches us this. If you go, I'm just going to read through a few passages here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The word of truth is the Bible. So Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, Rightly handle the Bible, meaning you can wrongly handle and interpret the Bible. A wrong way and a right way to understand the Scripture. Peter comes along and does the same thing later. Peter in 2 Peter 3 is talking about Paul's writings in the Scripture, the New Testament. Here's what Peter says. 
He says, there are some things in them, that is the scriptures that Paul writes, that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So look at what Peter does here. He says, the Bible can be dangerous. He says, you can twist or distort the scriptures to say or teach things that are not true and not right. You can make the Bible say just about anything you want it to say. You can pick any theology, probably any cultural view, probably just about any political view, and, and find a Bible verse somewhere because there are thousands of them. And you can probably find a verse that will, in your mind, support what you want to think and believe. But that's not the right way to, right way to approach the Scripture, is it? And then, though, a few examples of that. You take um, Mormons, for example, who would say, the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, they would say, yeah, we believe the Bible. But they would cite particular verses out of the Bible, taken out of context, to say things that we know are not true. So, for example, Mormon theology is, um, in short, you can become a god one day yourself. You're like, well, how would they get that out of the Bible? And that seems crazy to us, right? Well, let me give you a couple what they would refer to as proof text. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. If you remember in the very beginning, Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden. And here's what God said. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. God says, man's become like us. He can become a God. And then Jesus said in Matthew 5, You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Mormons would say, well, there you go. There's two Bible verses that basically say you can be God. And if you just look at those two verses by themselves without looking at the rest of the scriptures, and if you've been smoking something, I could see how you might say we could become gods, right? So there's a right way and a wrong way uh, to read the Bible. And then finally, over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, Paul uh, writes again to a young pastor named Timothy, and he says, preach the word, that's the word of God, be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching, for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. That means like sound teaching from the Bible. But according to their own desires, they will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. Now, we saw this fulfilled in the modern day, don't we? I mean, we don't. it's not our job to sit up here and throw stones at, at other churches and, and all that. But let's just be honest. You can find any church anywhere saying and preaching a lot of things that are not in accordance with the Word of God. But people like it, and it, and it itches their ears. But the, the point here is, Scripture is clear. Paul says there is sound doctrine, and therefore there is unsound doctrine. In other words, two people can read the same Bible verse. Two people can read the same Bible passage. One person can walk away correctly understanding the passage, and the other person can walk away incorrectly understanding that passage. All that to say, this is your next fill in the blank, it's not enough to simply say, I believe the Bible. It's not enough to say that. Proper interpretation of the Bible is absolutely essential. Any Bible passage means something, and it does not mean something else. I want to say that again. Any Bible passage means something. And therefore, it does not mean something else. So when we misinterpret the Bible, not only can it hinder our spiritual growth, uh, but it can actually do a lot of damage. Some of the worst damage that has been done to people has been through a misuse of the Bible. Because when you quote, God is the reason for whatever it is, it's hard to argue with God, right? So there has been all kinds of really bad things that happen in the name of religion when people misunderstand and misconstrue the scripture. Uh, scripture, for example, cults or false religions that that we would say lead people to hell 
have been formed out of oftentimes misunderstandings of the Bible. Most people that are religious, in particular in America, that have been led astray from Christ are not reading uh, the teachings of Satan or Marilyn Manson. Many of them have read the Bible. Many of them have been taught the Bible, but they've been reading the Bible incorrectly or taught the Bible incorrectly. And so that is why, really at their root, false religions and cults uh, are satanic. Many cults are formed by Satan because what he does is he leads people astray by twisting God's word. So your next blank is Satan knows the Bible very well and he is very happy to use it for his purposes. Satan knows the Bible well and is happy to use it for his purposes. Isn't this what Satan did at the very beginning? Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve. And what does he say in chapter 3 verse 1? He, he twist God's word. He said, Adam, Eve, he said, did God really say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, that's not what God said, right? God's, God said you, you can't eat from any tree except one, right? But, but Satan twists that. He keeps most of what God's, he just switched out a couple words, totally distorts what God said. To try to lead Adam and Eve astray. He does the same thing with Jesus. You go to Matthew chapter 4 in the the wilderness where Jesus is being tempted by the devil. And and what does Satan do? He quotes scripture to Jesus. He misuses scripture to try to tempt Jesus to sin. So he says things to Jesus like, Jesus, uh, jump uh, jump off this temple. Because the Bible says the angels will come and save you. Jesus, don't you trust your father? And so one of the devil's favorite instruments to use is the Bible. And what he'll do is Satan will take just enough of the Bible to deceive and give off the appearance that it's something from God. But then he'll manipulate it, twist it for his own destructive purposes once people are sucked in. I could give a thousand examples, Jehovah's Witnesses, classic example of taking parts of Scripture. If you will go have lunch or dinner with a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, they can quote you all kinds of Bible. And so that's why we as Christians have to be very prepared. Because they're not pulling stuff off Google, you know. They're not like quoting random poems from Utah in the 1700s. They're quoting Bible verses, but they're twisting them. They're manipulating them. And so that's why you have to be very careful. And this is the last thing I'll say about that. Uh, Acts of terrorism, hate crimes have been committed by people who had a twisted understanding of the Bible. I think I said this on the way out last week. The KKK, for example are very religious people. They would say their authority is the Bible. They set crosses on fire because of Romans chapter 8, verse number 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so when they hate people of color and they set crosses on fire in their minds, they're doing so to honor God. They're doing so, and they would say the Bible is their authority. And that's a very extreme example, of course. But the point I'm making is understanding the Scripture correctly is very important. Or we can get into some very dangerous territory. All right. So that leads to this question. Uh, well, okay, who determines the meaning of a biblical text? Who determines what the Bible means? Well, let's take an example of a somewhat controversial Bible verse that you've heard at some point, Acts 2.38. Let's just look at this for a minute, and let's look at uh, various ways to interpret. Peter replied, this is in the sermon uh, on the day of Pentecost. Peter said, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, so just kind of look at that verse and kind of in your mind think, all right, what do you think that means? Repent, be baptized. In the name of Jesus, forgiveness of sins, and you'll get the Holy Spirit. Okay. All right, first question, what does that verse mean? Second question, 
Well, who gets to determine what that verse means? I'm going to give you four various interpretations. The Baptist church, and when I say Baptist, I don't just mean a church that says Baptist on the sign, but people that are what we call Baptistic. Um, the Baptist church would say, okay, this verse means we're saved by repentance and faith in Jesus. And since we're truly saved, we will certainly want to be baptized out of obedience to Jesus. But, but Baptists would say, but the baptism itself does not save you. Uh, the Church of Christ would come along, look at the exact same verse. The Church of Christ would say, no, this verse is clear. Baptism is absolutely necessary if you want to have your sins washed away. I mean, the text says it. Repent and be baptized, and you'll be forgiven of your sins. And so the Church of Christ would say, if you've believed in Jesus, but you've not been baptized, you can have no real security that you're going to heaven. Then the Pentecostal church would come along and say, yeah, they would say, yeah, we, you repent and believe to be saved. But they would focus more on the end of that verse where it says you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But they would say, you know, when you believe in Jesus, you receive the Spirit in, in some sense. But you don't fully receive the Spirit unless you've spoken in tongues. That would be the Pentecostal, whatever. Then the, the Catholic Church would come along and they would say, you know, this verse shows baptism is absolutely necessary for salvation. In fact, this is why we sprinkle our babies, to ensure that they, in fact, go to heaven. So you got one Bible verse, four different interpretations. But it can't mean all four. So... Who gets to determine what that verse means, for example? Well, clearly, it's the Baptist interpretation. Uh, because John the Baptist was a Baptist. I mean, it's just kind of obvious. I'm <laughs> joking. I, I do actually think it is the Baptist interpretation, but it's not because John the Baptist was necessarily a Baptist. Um, anyway, all right, so let, let's dig into this. There are multiple views on who gets to determine what a biblical text means. I'm just going to look at two of them. There's a lot, but only two are the main ones. The first view I'm going to share is what I think is the incorrect view. And it's, well, I'll just call it option one. The reader determines the meaning of the biblical text. Now, I know that sounds confusing, but let me, hear me out. I think it's the incorrect view that the reader, we get to determine ultimately the meaning of the text. Now, the dominant approach of the secular academy, for example, um, or, or a, a form of, of Christianity that in, in our mind is not in step with the scriptures, um, they, they interpret text in such a way that the reader is the final determiner of what the text means. This is sometimes called the, this is your next blank, reader response approach. The reader response approach. And according to this approach, here's what that means. All right, you're in your discipleship group or your small group, okay, or your Sunday school class, and you're studying that verse on baptism, Acts 2.38, that we just talked about. And everybody's discussing it. Jimmy says, you know, I, I think it means this. And Sally says, well, I, I think it means this. And, and so-and-so says this. Okay, let's say the apostle Peter himself, who wrote the verse, right, comes down from heaven, supernaturally appears, you know, like, whoa, where, how'd Peter come here? And let's say Peter says, I've been listening to y'all's conversation about Acts 2 to 38. Jimmy, Jimmy, that's not what I meant in that verse at all. And I'm the one that wrote it. But, but the reader response version would say, Peter, we don't care what you think. Who cares what you meant? This is what the verse means to me. In other words, this incorrect view, I believe, says there is no objective Hard and fast, definite meaning to a text. The text can mean different things to different people. Y'all tracking with me? All right, uh, let's give a couple examples. Uh, we've all done this, especially as kids. You're driving down the road. You look out in the window of your car, and you, and you see the clouds, right? And how many times have you been able to look at a cloud and say, oh, that looks like something, right? So let's say you look up at the clouds, and you're like, man, look, that cloud is in the shape of a man's face. Like, that looks just like a person, kind of like that one does, you know? And then you say to your friend, hey, do you see that, Jimmy? Like, that looks just like a person's face. And then Jimmy says, you know, uh, I don't see a man's face at all. When I see that cloud, you know, I see, uh, I see a basketball. That one doesn't really look like a ball, but you know, you know my point, right? Now he's like, no, I, I don't see a guy's face. I totally see a basketball. So you got, you got two people looking at the same cloud. 
One person sees a man's face. The other person sees uh, a basketball. Well, that is the reader response approach to interpreting the Bible. The Bible verse can mean different things to different people, and you can both be right. This can be a great danger in small groups. So for those of us that lead community groups or discipleship groups or you teach a Bible class of some kind, this is very important. We need to avoid, we need to avoid doing this, okay? Reading a Bible verse or going through a passage and then going around the room and say, okay, let's go around and everybody say what this verse means to you. How many of us have been in a community group or a Bible study where that's happened before? What does this verse mean to you, Sarah? Well, Joe, what does this verse mean to you? Now, that sounds like a very uh, open thing to do and a very way to get conversation going. I'm not saying the intent is bad, but that is a very dangerous thing to do, actually. Because when we do that, we're going to get all kinds of different, likely contradictory meanings. So, your next blank. The goal of biblical interpretation is not to figure out what the verse means to us as the reader. As strange as that may sound, that's not the goal. The goal of biblical interpretation is to find out what God meant when he inspired the text. If you want to write out to the side, we sometimes call that authorial intent. Authorial intent. What did the author of the text mean when they wrote it? Now, quick sidebar on that before I come back and talk about that a few more minutes. This does not mean that the same Bible verse or the same Bible passage may not apply differently to different people at various points in our lives. Right? So while the meaning of any verse is limited, any verse can't mean 27 things to 27 people. The meaning of the text is limited, but the same verse may convict or encourage us in a different way. Let me give a quick example. John 3, 16. Everybody knows that verse probably, um, or you at least heard it before. For God so loved the world that gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in Jesus shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, even right now, some of us hear that verse, and we're like, man, uh, that really encourages me tonight, because this week I've really messed up. I've sinned a lot. And I just kind of feel like a failure at being a Christian. But you know what? This verse reminds me God loves me, and he loves me so much he sent Jesus. I'm not condemned. I'm forgiven. I'm going to heaven because Jesus died for me. And that would be true. That verse teaches that. Someone else is here tonight, and you read that verse, and, and here's how it hits you. You're like, man, I've got a family member that's not saved, and they are so far from God. Man, they're out there running around, and they're not doing well, and they're a thousand miles from God. But this verse encourages me that they can still be saved. No matter how hard-hearted they are, whosoever believes in Jesus will be saved. They're not too far gone for God. And that would be true, too. right? So the ultimate meaning of John 3.16 is the love of God for sinners uh, because Jesus has died for us. But depending on the season we're in, that verse may encourage us or speak to us in different ways, okay? Now, now back to the incorrect view. Here's something else about the reader response approach. It's your next blank. Those who take that approach would rather affirm various conflicting interpretations. So the fill in the blank is conflicting, they would rather take, uh, have various uh, conflicting interpretations and suggest one interpretation is more valid than another. Okay, so they would reject any kind of absolute statements. So they would dismiss a sentence that begin with, you know, the meaning of this text is, they would say, ah, oh, it's way too narrow-minded. You, you, you can't say that's what that text means, but they would love it if you said, you know, to me, this text means, now, what does it mean to you? So the, the root of that is in, in kind of a pluralistic, and that is kind of, it's a fancy way of saying, like kind of all the religions and all the spirituality is kind of merging together. Nobody's really right. Nobody's really wrong. We're just all, it kind of all works out in the end with God. So in a pluralistic, all-inclusive, politi uh, politically correct, don't offend anybody society, it's seen as arrogant 
to claim final legitimacy for only one interpretation or opinion. That scene is narrow-minded, okay? But let's just shoot straight for a minute. There is one God, and God has one son, and this is his word. He wrote it, and God gets to determine what it means, and it can't mean all kinds of things to all kinds of people. Biblical Christianity is, by definition, exclusive. That's your next fill in the blank. I mean, our Lord Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to God except through me. Jesus, in that sense, was the most exclusive, narrow person ever to live. So when God inspired the Bible, he did not feel the pressure to accommodate everyone's views and feelings. Now, I know that sounds kind of, I don't know, uh, wow, ungracious. But sometimes in a spirit of trying to be so gracious and we want to try to accommodate it, we don't want to offend anybody, friends, we got to be very careful. There is a time when truth is truth, and it just is what it is, even if it hurts your friend's feelings. All right? Now, before we jump into what I think the correct view is to interpret Scripture, let me give you one uh, more example. This is by uh, uh, Dr. Robert Plummer up at a seminary who, who wrote the book that I'm using that I talked about last week. Uh, he, he gave this example of this uh, approach. He was reading a children's Bible with his daughter one night, and they came to the story of Joseph. You know that story in, I think it's Genesis 37. You know, J uh, Jacob gives Joseph the coat of many colors, right? They made a musical after it or something like that. Annie made me watch one time. And uh, so the children's Bible tells that story, and then the, the writer of the, of the children's Bible follows that story up with these questions for discussion with the child. And they wrote, has anyone ever given you something like a new coat or sweater? And then they write, uh, uh, little Jimmy, how did it make you feel to put on that new outfit? Now, on one hand, we're like, yeah, I think it's appropriate for a four-year-old. I, I get it. But the point is, it's clear that the author of that children's Bible values self-esteem and affirmation. There's nothing necessarily wrong with those things, of course. But the point is, the writer of the biblical text in Genesis 37 clearly is not telling the story of Joseph to teach self-esteem and affirmation. That's, that's not the point of the text at all. So that would be an example of uh, the author of the children's Bible creating a meaning for a Bible passage that God did not intend when he wrote it. Does that make sense? All right, so let's talk about the second option that I think is the correct view. Option two, the author of the biblical text determines the meaning of the text. The author of the biblical text determines the meaning of the text. So uh, do we have any art lovers in the house tonight? Any art lovers? Well, um, I'm so proud of our Ellie, who is becoming a little artist. You're going to see right here something she did recently. Um, we call this Ocean Face. I think it's awesome. You'll be able to purchase it soon on Etsy. And uh, Lord willing, shameless shout out. you got to pay for college somehow. I can only give so much plasma. So if you would like to purchase Ellie's art, Art Face, for $199.99, it can be yours tonight. Uh, but anyways, if you're an art lover, uh, you will appreciate this illustration next picture. The Sistine Chapel. Anybody been there before? Visited that? Uh, yeah, got a couple. Awesome. So built by the Pope within the Vatican, um, completed in 1481. But then in the 1500s, the most famous artwork in the Sistine Chapel came along with, you remember who? Michelangelo, the best Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Uh, he was the guy with the orange when he loved the pizza. I always related to him. But, uh, but anyway, so Michelangelo comes along and paints the, the last judgment uh, on, on the ceiling of the Sistine uh, Chapel. So over 400 uh, years later, though, in the 1980s, 1990s, all of Michelangelo's paintings were uh, restored and updated. And it caused a massive uproar in the art community. 
Now, here's what happened. For centuries, of course, uh, they didn't have electric lights. So they used candles to show off uh, Michelangelo's artwork. Well, after several hundred years, apparently the warmth of the candles can affect the ceilings. Uh, they had some earthquakes that caused cracks in the paintings, and there was some moisture that had come in. And so they, they wanted to redo the whole Sistine Chapel. And it sent the art community into a tizzy. Because they said, you've changed Michelangelo's art. The colors are way too bright with all of your updates. So the question was whether 400 years of burning candles made the brighter colors more somber or whether Michelangelo intended them to be more somber all along, which is likely the case. He tended to paint with more somber colors. So some people say, well, why does that even matter? Well, it matters because it was Michelangelo's art. And people that travel around the world to go to the Sistine Chapel, they want to see Michelangelo's original masterpiece. We don't want to see someone else's reinterpretation. We want to see the real thing by the man himself, the original painter. The original artist alone gets to determine what he meant and what he intended with his painting. Well, the same thing is true with the Bible. At the end of the day, our interpretation isn't what matters most. What did the author mean when they wrote the text? Let me give you another example uh, just from life to help illustrate it. Let's say tomorrow you're going to go grab lunch with a coworker. And you say, hey, let's go to Old Hickory. I want brisket today. And they respond to you, why do you hate people from Mexico? <laughs> and you're like, what are you talking about? Did you not hear what I said? <laughs> I said nothing about Mexico or people from Mexico. I love quesadillas. I love Cancun. I just want brisket today. Now, it's kind of a silly, lighthearted example. But how frustrating is it? When you're having a conversation or an argument with someone, and they completely misunderstand you. Is there anything more frustrating? I know it's never happened in a relationship with a spouse before, right? It, but, but we're like, hey, that is, how many times have you said to a friend or a coworker or a boyfriend or a spouse, are you even listening to me? That is not what I said at all. You are putting words in my mouth. How many, how many times have we said that? You are misunderstanding me. That is not what I meant. Here is what I meant. So the author of a message is the final determiner in what the message means. Next fill in the blank. Any act of communication is only authentic when someone is trying to convey meaning to us and we respond to the meaning intended by the speaker or writer. Otherwise, it's disingenuous. It's not even legitimate communication. Now, with all of that being said, remember what we said from last week. The Bible is duly authored. That, that means it's written by both God and man. Men penned the Bible with their physical hands, but the Holy Spirit inspired them and carried them along, so God and man wrote the Bible. So, the goal of biblical interpretation is to answer this question. What does God, through the human author, desire for the intended audience to understand when they receive the original text? That's the goal of biblical interpretation. What did the original author mean when they wrote the text? So when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're going to start with that next week. Um, what did he mean when he said that? Not how do we want to change it 2,000 years later to appease ourselves and our culture but what did Paul intend when he said it? That is the goal of Bible study. Okay? And we're going to take the last two weeks, next week and the week after, to answer, well, how do we find out what he meant? How do we interpret? Um, but that's the next two weeks. Lastly for tonight, and then we'll do questions. Um, can a biblical text have more than one meaning? So if the goal of biblical interpretation is to find out the author's original meaning, can a biblical text have more than one meaning? And the short answer is yes. 
And here's the fill in the blank. A text can have more than one meaning if the author intends and or if the additional meaning implication is a natural overflow of the principles communicated in the text. And I'm sure that is clear as mud. Even when I, I was like, I kind of found a way to word that, but like, I don't even know what I mean by that. <laughs> That's Holy Spirit, help, help us. Uh, let me try to explain it. All right, take an Old Testament author, for example. Uh, let's say Hosea. Okay, would Hosea, who wrote 700 years ago, or, or who, I'm sorry, who wrote 700 years before Christ, uh, would Hosea say, you know, what I'm writing here should just be understood only in this narrow historical context in 760 B.C.? Or, to use Greg Beale's language, would Hosea allow that his writing intention, when he wrote Hosea all those years ago, his intention was larger than even he understood it to be at the time because Hosea believed he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as part of God's larger story that is still unfolding. Remember said last week, the Bible is one Meta narrative or story about Jesus is being progressively revealed. Remember, we said last week, Isaiah said said prophecies about Jesus, and he didn't even know when they were going to happen, or even that his name was Jesus. So the biblical authors were operating in faith. They're like, "Hey, I'm writing this that the Spirit's given me, and I don't even entirely know what it means or when it's going to happen or who it's about." So you have to understand that tension there, and so I think. That's the sense in which a text can have multiple meanings. God may give a meaning to a text that even the author themselves at the time didn't fully understand. Let me try to illustrate it. What have I said to you? Uh, you know, there's nothing I enjoy more than sitting on my back porch now that it's spring uh, in a lawn chair and sipping on a cherry Coke and listening to uh, Tyler Childers. Now, if you don't know who Tyler Childers is, you should. He is a country artist from Kentucky that's amazing, especially his latest album entitled, Can I Take My Hounds to Heaven? It is very theologically uh, astute. <laughs> he broke all the biblical principles in writing that song. But anyway, so let's, let's say, hey, I love sitting on my back porch, sipping cherry Coke, listening to Tyler Childers. Man, that is the best way to spend a spring night. So you leave that conversation with me, and you're hanging out with another friend. You say, hey, you know, I was talking to Jameis earlier, you know, and he told me he loves drinking cherry Coke, and he loves listening to Tyler Childers. And, and they, what if they were to say, well, does Jameis like other artists too, like Chris Stapleton and Dwight Oakham? Well, well the answer to the question would be yes. Because I was just referring to Tyler Childers as part for a whole. So when I said, you know, I love listening to Tyler Childers, there was more in my intention than just him. I just wasn't going to take the time to list you every country artist I like. It would take an hour. But, but if someone said, okay, but now does Jameis like heavy metal? The answer would be no. Uh, no offense. First and foremost, because that is Satan's music. Side note here, this is just too fun. Do you remember, I think I heard this for the first time in the 80s, um, how allegedly if you take certain heavy metal songs and you play them backwards, there's hidden satanic messages. Has anybody tried that? It, 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 it's actually kind of freaky. Stairway to Heaven, Led Zeppelin, if you play it backwards, do you know what it says? I can't believe I'm saying this. Take this off YouTube. Uh, <laughs> And seriously, though, if, if you say it, if you play it backwards, it says, um, it, it gives this hidden message of speaking to Satan, and he gives you the mark of 666. Now, there's another one that's less scary initially. When you think about the eagles in Hotel California, you think, well, there could be nothing satanic about that, and you would be wrong. Because if you play that song backwards, it says, quote, Satan, he hears this. He had me believe. Go check it out. Anyway, here's my point. I'm really not serious about all that. If someone says, well, does, does Jameis like heavy metal? The answer would be no. Because heavy metal was clearly outside my intention when I mentioned Tyler Childers. 
So even though I did not have Chris Stapleton and Dwight Yoakam in my narrow intention when I spoke those words, it would be correct to think they are part of my wider intention because they're the same type as Tyler Childers. Does that kind of make sense? All right, let's look at some examples in the Bible because that's also true with the biblical authors. All right, sometimes, next blank, biblical prophecies can have what scholars call double fulfillment. A classic example is 2 Samuel chapter 7. Okay, God is speaking to David, and God says, David, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So God here, this is way before Christ came, right? There's no mention of Jesus. God promises a son and a house and a kingdom to David. Now this is fulfilled in the short term in David's son, who? Solomon. Solomon received a house. Solomon received a kingdom. But that's not the ultimate and final fulfillment of that prophecy, is it? When you come along to the New Testament, Luke 1, 32 and 33, if you're interested later, Luke 1, 32, 33, and Hebrews 1, 5, the New Testament, they tell us the, the full and ultimate fulfillment of that takes place in Jesus. So is that prophecy in 2 Samuel fulfilled in Solomon or Jesus? Yes. Both are true. It had two intentions or what we'll call double fulfillment. One fulfilled in Solomon, the other one to be fulfilled in Jesus. And you see that quite often actually in the Old Testament. And even sometimes in the New Testament. And I'm, this, I'm out of my notes here, so I hope I don't say anything too wrong. But um, this, maybe we could do this next week. But, you know, you go, for example, to Matthew chapter 24 and 25. The Olivet Discourse. It's the classic teaching about Jesus teaching on the end of the world. There's all kinds of various views about, well, when is the end of the world going to happen, etc. So Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple, right? You know, when you see this happen, you know, the end is coming. Well, did that mean the destruction of the temple in AD 70, that that was the, this prophecy fulfilled because that's already happened? Or is Jesus referring to the future? And the answer is probably yes. Most conservative scholars say, yeah, there's, there's double fulfillment there. Jesus was taught, some of that prophecy was fulfilled when the temple was destroyed in AD 70. Some of it is still yet to happen. So a lot of times in Scripture, it's quite mysterious. And you can have double fulfillments with the same teaching. Because again, the biblical narrative, imagine stair steps. And from the beginning of time, going all the way up to the second coming of Christ, it's stair steps, and it's building on each other. But sometimes the authors writing, they don't know where they are in proximity to the top of the steps. And I think you see that with, uh, in 2 Samuel here and also last week with Isaiah. Let's look at another example, though, because this is kind of the fun question. Uh, did the biblical authors themselves know if the text they were writing could have multiple meanings or multiple levels of fulfillment? I think the answer is likely sometimes they knew, sometimes they didn't. Okay, so there are biblical passages, next fill in the blank, that God has an intention that the human author did not understand. Benjamin Morrison points out that one of the clearest examples is Daniel. In your Old Testament Bible, Daniel recorded the visions God gave him, but Daniel plainly tells us he did not understand their meaning. In Daniel 8, for example, Daniel received a vision, and then he says in verse 27, Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Daniel says the same thing in chapter 12, verse 8 and 9. So, the point is, sometimes Daniel gets these visions, and he was like, I don't know what they mean. Like, I know God gave it to me. I ain't got a clue what it means. Okay, so in Morrison's words, here, here's your next fill in the blank. And this is kind of a mouthful. You kind of got to, this is one you're going to go home and read it over and over. God's intention in Scripture sometimes goes beyond the human author's intention. God may intend more than the human author does, but never less and never at odds with the human author's intent. 
Now, let me give one, uh, two more quick examples, then we'll, we'll be done. All right. Uh, let's look at an, uh, the, the New Testament use of the Old Testament. Go to Matthew 2, verse 15. Uh, look at what Matthew quotes uh, out of Hosea chapter 11. So, okay, so Matthew says, out of Egypt, I called my son. That's straight out of the book of Hosea. Matthew tells us in verse 15 that that prophecy is fulfilled in baby Jesus. Remember, Jesus is born and Herod wants to kill all the little babies. Remember, so Mary and Joseph take him to Egypt, another country, to protect Jesus. Remember that? So Matthew says, Hosea 11 was about Jesus, the baby. But when you read Hosea 11, which was written over 700 years before baby Jesus came, there's no mention of Jesus or indication that the phrase has anything to do with Jesus. Hosea's interpretation is it's explaining how God brought Israel uh, out of Egyptian slavery back in the book of Exodus. But, but Matthew says, this verse points us to Christ. Now, here's what's fascinating. We don't know this for sure, but it's unlikely that when Hosea wrote those words 700 years earlier, it's unlikely he was thinking about Jesus. But the Holy Spirit was thinking about Jesus when he inspired Hosea. And so the Spirit inspired Hosea to write those words pointing us to Christ, even if Hosea didn't fully understand it at the time. All right, last one. Uh, sometimes, fill in the blank, the biblical writer may intend and allow for additional implications, that's the word, implications, that are not explicitly stated in the text, so long as the implication is a natural overflow of the principles communicated in the text. I think we said that one earlier, so we'll do it again. All right, this is somewhat of a humorous example, maybe. Uh, Ephesians 5.18, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and he says, Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, so don't get drunk with wine. Now, let's imagine a situation. Paul comes back from heaven, all right? Or he just shows up unexpectedly to the church at Ephesus. So they've read his letter. Paul comes in to visit this church, and he finds them just wasted. I, as drunk as the fellow at the country music concert after his dog died and his girlfriend left him. I mean, just drunk as a skunk. And Paul comes in and says, did you not get my letter? I told you in chapter 5, verse 18, do not get drunk with wine. And one of the deacons stands up and says, Brother Paul, we got your letter and we obeyed your letter. We have not drank wine in months. We've turned to beer. <laughs> now, now, how would Paul respond, do you think? Would Paul say, oh, my bad, no worries. If it was wine, I'd be ticked off. But don't worry about the beer. Drink on, brothers. Uh, no, that's not what Paul would have said. Paul would have said, well, yeah, I meant beer too. Because Paul uses the word drunk in verse 18. It just means intoxicated. So the, the point of the text is, he, is taking something into our body that causes us to lose control of our thinking and actions, right? That's the principle. That's the meaning of the text. So when Paul penned these words 2,000 years ago to the church at Ephesus, he probably was not thinking about granddaddy's moonshine that granddaddy makes in eastern Kentucky. It's probably not what Paul had in mind. But the principle of not getting drunk has many modern-day implications of which Paul was not even consciously aware like Maker's Mark or Woodford Reserve or whatever Kentucky folks like to drink these days. Whatever it is, the principle is don't get drunk, you see? So again, in conclusion, a biblical text can have more than one meaning if the author intends it or if the additional meaning implication is a natural overflow of the principles communicated in the text. All right, well, I think that's a good stopping point. Um, let's, uh, yeah, we've got a few minutes anyway. So does anybody have any questions you want to talk about tonight? Yes, sir.
Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I think, I think that what you just said is is correct. I think uh, that's a lot to repeat. Uh, uh, actually, you know what, Dan? We got a microphone. Hey, could you give the short version of that question? That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. So James just said that verse from Hosea, out of Egypt, I called my son. When you listen to that verse, and I think Jameis was talking about this earlier, in that time of Hosea, it feels like he's referring back to the Lord called Moses to deliver the Israelites from bondage, from Ramesses, right? Across the Red Sea to the land of Canaan. Joshua, you know, took it, took him over. And that same sort of meta-narrative, if Matthew is making that reference, my my gut was telling me like is that the same sort of that same double prophetic thing where you talk about david solomon towards jesus moses the israelites that rock beginning skipping the pond the meta narrative in the bible ultimately with the goal to jesus so that was my question is that are you saying that is sort of a similar example because it seems to me in the time of hosea he is referring to moses Matthew is, the question is, is he taking what maybe was about Moses and is just extrapolating that like a Solomon, David Solomon, Jesus, you know, example? That was my question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the answer is yes. I think that's exactly what's happening. So in Scripture, we have what's called progressive revelation, right? So the to use that step illustration, the higher we get up to steps, the, the more is revealed. So Matthew, by the time we get to Matthew 2,000 years ago, he has a more robust understanding of God's story than Hosea did 700 years prior. And Hosea had a more robust understanding of God's story than Moses did back in Exodus, right? So it's like, depending on when God lets you be born, we know more today about the, the finality of the gospel than, than even uh, Matthew did in some sense, right? Uh, because we're on this side. Jesus is back to heaven. So you've got this progressive revelation. And so, yeah, I think what you said is exactly correct. And I think that the beautiful thing about the Bible is this one coherent story. So what happened with Moses and then Hosea and Matthew, it's all blending together. And the further and further you get towards the top of the steps, it becomes more and more clear. And then even Corinthians alludes to, you know, when we get to heaven, we're going to see even more clearly then, right? So there will be things we'll understand about God's story when we get to heaven that we don't understand now. And we're very beneficial to be on this side of the cross. I mean, think about your Abrahams, your Isaacs, your Jacobs, your Josephs, and all these people. They didn't get to see Christ, right? We're on this side of the cross. We know the tomb is empty. We know Christ. They knew he was going to come one day, but we know it's already happened. And so in some sense, it's a great time to be a Christian, right? We get to see uh, this side of the cross. That's a great question. Anybody else? You were talking about, like, children book authors and the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors. So whenever they're asking the kids the questions that they wrote in the book, and that's, like, the wrong interpretation, should we ask the kids the correct interpretation? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. So I, that's a really good question. So I think, first of all, children's Bibles are a great thing. Okay, so in giving that illustration, I'm not saying, hey, stay away from children's Bible Bibles. Um, and I do think it's good, like when we taught our kids the scripture when they were super young, to try to find ways to connect it to them for sure. I think the big thing we want to do, whether it's as teachers and valley kids or parents or grandparents or whatever, is, is try to help our kids understand the true meaning of the text. So, for example, I probably wouldn't spend a lot of time on self-esteem and affirmation with Joseph in the Code of Many Colors. I would really, in, in that case, okay, kids, what, what does this say about God's faithfulness? What does this teach us? You know, what about this Joseph guy? And, and what is his part in God's bigger story? And you may not use that language. You're going to bring it down, and you're going to explain. This is next week's lecture, by the way. How does the Old Testament point us to Jesus? Okay, what does Joseph have to do with Jesus? And the answer is he has everything to do with Jesus. And so I think if when I'm working with little kids, that's what I'm trying to do. Help them get the big picture of the Bible is actually about Jesus. So David and Goliath, the classic example. The, 
And, and, you know, the main point of the story, no offense to the Christian film industry, is not face your giants. I mean, it's, it's really not the main point of David and Goliath, right? Like, you can do anything you want to do. Not really. The main point is actually pointing us to David, the warrior conquer king, right, who, who slays the giant. David, we learn next week, points us to Christ who comes and slays sin, you know. So learn to er- interpret Scripture through the lens of Jesus, and that's always a safe bet. Any Bible passage, like, what do I do with this? Figure out how to get it to Jesus, and you're probably in pretty good territory is a good way to do that. That's another good question. All right, we got time for just a couple more. Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, so, how would you go about um, deciding kind of that second interpretation um, that somebody may present of a Bible passage of... Um, I mean, it's kind of easy when Matthew's interpreting Old Testament scripture and saying, well, here's the ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. Uh, But certainly, I think sometimes in Bible studies that I've been in, people have taken a a specific Bible passage and maybe, well, this is what the author intended to that particular audience, but we're going to, it could also be broadened out and and also mean sort of this to everybody or all Christians. I mean, how do you find sort of that, is this what God intended for that verse to mean, or was it really more of a specific meaning to that people at that time? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question, and uh, we will get into some of that next week. Um, I'll try to give a real quick answer, but th- that's a million-dollar question, right? So, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. All right, ladies, this will apply to you very immediately. The Bible says, ladies, basically, when you come to church, wear a head, head covering, all right? few of y'all got on hats, ladies, most of you don't. Are you in sin? Okay, well, I don't think so, but why? Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, so there is a time when there's cultural context that no longer applies to us today, and that would be an example. I think Paul's main point there is not physically ladies wear a head covering. His point, if you look at the, so I should answer this. Context is king. Okay, so anytime you're studying, and this is next week's lecture too, anytime you're studying the Bible, don't just look at one isolated verse, but the verses around it. Paul's larger argument in 1 Corinthians 11 is on uh, uh, authority. He's talking about Christ, you know, in the Trinity, you got Christ as the head. He says the husband is the head of the wife. So Paul's teaching about those relationships between men and women. And so in that culture, for a woman to wear a head covering was a sign uh, that she's alongside her husband. In the same way that today, for example, maybe ladies wearing a wedding ring would be. So probably if Paul were teaching that text, if Paul were to rewrite 1 Corinthians 11 to the church at Pleasant Valley, he would probably say, ladies, uh, honor your husband uh, by wearing your wedding ring. Maybe. You see what I'm saying? So there are times when the cultural context, uh, it can change. But there are other times when the principles are exactly the same and they don't change at all. And that's where... It's tricky, right? How do we know which ones carry on and which ones don't? And if you want to know the answer to that question, you got to come back next week. Very good question, though. Yeah. What we'll do one more, seven thirty-three. And by the way, if you needs to leave. Feel free to slide out. You won't offend anybody, and we can keep taking a few questions here for another minute. All right. Anybody else? Dr. Jameis, um, in your two decade, uh, two decades of life devoted to full time ministry, what is the most, in your experience, what's the most misinterpreted scripture that from well intended Christians? And two part question. Number two, which one bothers you the most? When I saw your hand go up, this is going to be a good one. I said, I was, hey, that is a good question, Matt. What is the most? Uh, um, you know, this is going to offend somebody. <laughs> I think Jeremiah 29, 11, 
God says, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you, etc., is a great Bible verse. God said it. I think we throw it on every coffee mug and bumper sticker and apply it in a way that was not initially intended really. So that, and I, we'll talk about that next week. Um, not saying Jer- that God doesn't have great plans for us. But when you look at that context, context is king. He was not speaking that to an individual. He was speaking that to the covenant people of Israel. He was saying, Israel, y'all been through a lot of stuff. You've been through Egypt and wilderness. And he's like, I I have plans to prosper you as a nation. From you, Israel, will come the Messiah, the Christ. Right? So so when Jeremiah says, I have great plans, he's not saying, I'm going to give you a brand new Mercedes which is sometimes how we can interpret, oh, well, you know, uh, God's going to give me all I've ever hoped to drink. It's almost like in a prosperity gospel kind of way at times, and I just don't think that's the point of that verse. What was the second question? Which one? I don't know. If anybody else has one, feel free to say it. I'll have to think on that. Nothing's immediately coming to mind. What's that? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, so Philippians 4.13. Okay, I'm just going to stop because they're all great. I mean, it's God's word, but like, we want to Tim Tebow Philippians 4.13. I mean, I love Tim Tebow, but like the point of I can do all things through Christ your strength is me is not I can get another touchdown. Like, it's just not the point. Right, if you look at the context, right, it's like persevering through suffering and how in Jesus we're going to, you know. So that's another one that, great verse that we throw on coffee mugs, but like the point of I can do all things isn't you can you can become the CEO of the company. In most cases, it's not the point. Yeah. what Should we wrap this up, Dana, Samantha, or should we keep going? The birthday girl, we can't say no. All right, what you got? This is, I probably don't need this, but anyway. Um, I just want to see if other people's experience uh, spiritual experience has been like mine since I've had a lot of years of it since I was 10 and you all know now what I am tonight and (laughs) but since we are talking about interpreting the scripture do you see yourself uh, being able to hear from the Holy Spirit a more clear message the longer you're a Christian and the more you read the Bible that's a great question. And next week, we're going to start there. Uh, no, I, I, I'm, really, I'm really not trying to. It's just the truth. We really are going to start there. And so next week, we're going to do four principles for learning to interpret the Bible. And the number one principle is enter into Bible reading with prayer. That's what you said, because the Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. Prayer is conversation with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the best way to better understand the Bible is not to Google it. What, you know... There's a time and a place. The best thing is, okay, Lord, I'm opening up the Bible. Holy Spirit, help me understand what it means. Nobody understands the Bible better than the one who wrote it. The Holy Spirit wrote it. So do you want to understand the Bible better? Ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate that. So in short, Miss Phyllis, yes, I think the more we pray and the more time we spend with God in prayer and the Word, I do think we will better understand the Bible over time. But I also think with that, we have to be, you know, humble and careful. I'll say this, the the older I've gotten and the more I've studied the Bible, I'm realizing actually the less I know about the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Like there are things I interpret in Scripture today that I did not interpret 10 years ago. And I think I was wrong 10 years ago. Now, 10 years ago, I thought I was right about everything. Now I'm like, uh, yeah, I think I was wrong on that. So I think the Holy Spirit is always teaching us. and sa- So as Christians, we're sanctified in every avenue of life. We're all growing. Well, don't we anticipate we're growing and understanding the Bible too? So just never feel like we've gotten to the point where we got it all figured out. So I just want to be very humble. You know, even in teaching the things tonight, like, there are certain things we can say, absolutely, no if ands, and buts, Christ is the only way to heaven, you know, et cetera, all these things. But there are other areas of Scripture that are more gray, and, you know, I'm like, all right, I want to be humble about this. And they're, they're what we call close-handed issues and open-handed issues. Close-handed issues are the things there is no negotiating this. Christ is God. 
The Bible is God's word. There is one way to heaven. His name is Jesus. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Like those are things, those are hills we will die on and fight on. There are other things in scripture we're going to hold more loosely, like the end times. When's that going to happen? Is the, is the tribulation, you know, uh, is, is the rapture going to be before the tribulation? Like, I'm not going to fight you on that because there are a lot of great Christians that have very different views on that. Some of the spiritual gifts, right? I mean, speaking in tongues. There are wonderful Christians who have different views on that. I want to hold that a little more loose. Reformed theology, Calvinism, some of that. I mean, I have my opinions on that. But, uh, but there are great Christians who would disagree with me on that. So there are certain things that we might call second or third level issues that we're not going to fight about. Um, and you have to have discernment to know, okay, this is an area I want to dig in. And we know this is true because the Bible is clear. This is an area where, you know, the uh, Bible is not crystal clear there. It, it seems to be open for some interpretation. And so I think you have to have discernment over time to know the difference. All right. Should we go now? So if you have the if you have the app um for Dairy Queen, uh, you get <laughs> you get 89 cent blizzards. And so I would encourage you to go uh right over here if you get that 89 cent blizzards is a great way to end your Wednesday night. All right. Thank you guys for being here. James, thank you so much. And thank you for doing Q&A.